John can tell you. John can tell you. It's good. It's good stuff. Let me tell you. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order, January fourteenth, twenty sixteen, seven o'clock here in City Hall. Fran, will you please do the roll call? Council members Ray Wall. Present. Fitzgerald. Present. Matt Figg. Present. Sacedo. Present. Bynum. Present. Harvey. Present. Spread. Present. All present, Your Honor. Thank you, Fran. The second item on the agenda is a resolution rejecting bids for the Community Development Block Grant Downtown Revitalization Project and setting public hearings for facade improvement and storm water improvements for the revitalization project. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution as submitted? So moved, Your Honor. Second, Your Honor. Thank you. Any discussion? Adam, are you here to tell us about it? Or? Yeah. If you want to hear. Yeah, the, the short version. Is there any specific questions or you just want kind of a, a summary of, of where we're at and what we're looking to do going forward? And what the schedule is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Keep it under 45 minutes, wouldn't you? In under 45. You know, I might, I might be able to hit that. Just, just a hair under. 44 minutes? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, so we, we did uh, open bids. Um, and bids came in high. That is why we're rejecting bids. Uh, the bids for the facade work was over the base bid was about $70,000 over the base bid and the work for the stormwater improvements which is the civil improvements was about $120,000 over the engineers estimates. Um, so again quite high but also built into our bid we had a number of alternates. Um, we had these alternates in there hoping if prices came back good, they came back well, we would have some extra money to leverage with some additional funds from the property owners to get additional work done. Obviously, bids did not come back well. So in moving forward with the project, all the alternates have been removed because none of the property owners were willing to put in additional money at the level that are uh, at, at the cost that they would be. Uh, much of the alternates were like doors and windows and given the Secretary of the Interior standards for how these have to be repaired made uh, a very simple window cost $5,000 um, where the property owners can hire a contractor go through other means of doing so and that window being uh, much less. So because of that none of the property owners wanted to put in put in money at the rate that they would have to put money in. Um, so because of that those alternates are being removed with uh, another property owner. Uh, he had windows built into his base bid that were extremely high. So those windows were removed from the bid going forward. When we were setting up the contracts with the property owners, they were all guaranteed a minimum that was comparable to what they had to do for their electrical upgrades project. So in one case, uh, you know, we have a property owner that they're doing $50,000 in electrical upgrades. Well, they're gonna get $50,000 in improvements out of the grant but their bid came in at 100,000, then we have to eliminate some items of work that are gonna be done so we can get more in line with the dollar amount that they were, they were gonna be given from the grant. So that's where items are being removed, that's where the alternates are being removed from. Our timetable going forward, in the new bid package that's going out, it has the facade work being completed by, substantially completed by the end of July. There still may be some punch list items uh, to complete. Uh, our conversations with the state have been as long as this project is completed this construction season, they are completely on board with. Um, so that, that is how we're proceeding and moving forward. Um, the electrical upgrades will be done first, then we will do the facade upgrades, and then we'll be looking at doing the stormwater improvements because the area that we're doing the stormwater improvements in is also going to be our staging area or lay down area for the project. Is this on alley number one? Yes. Wasn't that originally supposed to be done well over a year ago or so it's it has been it has been a long process of working with the property owners working with the state um there's been there's been elements of the project that were we were unexpected going into um that we had to complete um it's just it has uh allowed the dra the project to drag out much longer than we anticipated from the beginning but we are on track now to to complete the project all the property <coughs> owners are on board and that's ultimately what we're wait what had the project uh, take long was getting all the property owners on board and you know they're responsible for their electrical upgrades at their cost and making sure that they got their numbers right with the grant money that we had available. Um, 
you know, most, most of these CDBG projects, they're only working on 10 to 15 buildings, and we're taking on 26 buildings. So, you know, looking back on it, probably the scope of the project might have been a little much for, you know, the dollars that we actually had. But in the end, I think we're going to put together a quality project um, that we're able to successfully move forward with. Has MP MPW got everything they, they're going to need already ordered in here? Uh, we still have some additional conversations that we need to have with them uh, to that make sure that they're on board. They have, but they have plenty of time uh, for... Is that a no? That, that is a no, yes. Okay. Is there uh, a coordination where all the facades will be kind of worked on by the same contractor so there's a consistency in how it looks? Yep, so all the facade work will be bid out to one contractor. Um, at least on what we received from Woodruff, they did have, there was one main uh, general contractor and then they had subs that were completing such, you know, masonry <laughs> work or painting work or things such as that. Now, when you say uh, facade work, uh, generally, uh, what are you speaking of? Uh, tuck pointing and yep. uh, awnings and windows, et cetera? Yep, uh, facade work, yeah. Most of what we're going to be completing for this project is going to be tuck pointing, so uh, shoring up the, the brick facades, the rear facades and side facades of the buildings, and then painting. There's a significant, significant amount of painting that's done uh, with this project as well. Good. Who's your work with at MPW? Nick? Yep. Nick Nitzel? Yep. Good guy. Yeah. Okay. So with the windows being at a variety of prices, are we, we have a kind of a baseline standard window that they have to meet the specs architecturally correct for the downtown, or is it open season and they're going to put some Rust vinyl gold. cheapy? So, <coughs> so per, the, per this project, we have very specific uh, specifications that they have to meet for this project but outside of that I mean and I may be you know correct me if I'm wrong but a property owner can for the most part do what they want with their own property with if they're not using grant funds oh, okay so going forward you know they can do what they want with their window so if they're getting grant funds for the electrical but they're doing the rest of it, the work themselves they can do whatever they want yeah okay okay thank you thank you any other Thank questions? You. Thank you. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. Santos? Aye. Alan? Aye. Tom? Aye. Bob? Aye. Bill? Aye. Scott? Aye. Mike? Aye. Thank you. The third item on the agenda is a discussion on amending city council rules <laughs> to include invocation on city council agenda. Greg. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we had a request from Mayor Broderson to add invocation back into uh, the council rules and into the uh, agenda. In your packet tonight, you have uh, three items. You have the, uh, the uh, 1988, I believe, or order of business and the uh, 2012 order of business, and you also have a copy of the uh, current council mm -hmm. rules. Um, so it, it's really a pretty, pretty simple item for discussion tonight is whether or not council wishes or desires to add an opening prayer or invocation uh, back into the order of business uh, or not. And if you will note under chapter 10, I believe, of the, um, yes, chapter 10 on page 9 of the council rules uh, identifies the process for amending the council rules. The council may suspend any specific rule of the council upon three-fourths uh, vote of the members present. After having given written notice at a previous regular meeting, these rules may be amended at any regular meeting by a three-fourths vote of members of the council. Uh, so <clears throat> if council would desire to move forward with the, uh, the addition, at the next meeting we would provide notice following meeting the council would take action and it would require three quarters which in our case is six of seven council members Any discussion yeah please your honor uh, where in the agenda toward the beginning would it be inserted uh, most likely uh, uh, similar to the attachment uh, after after roll call um, okay all right Excuse me. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. After uh, uh, opening roll call, opening prayer, and pre pledge of allegiance, so just prior to the pledge. What was the history? Does anybody know of why it was dropped? I, Mayor O'Brien was uh, council. Uh, yeah, was, we, was here at the this, time. It it all it, it started with Mayor Shawlin. 
uh, and I don't know what her term it was. And then when Mayor O'Brien was there, we were having prayer at various at the meetings. We were trying to get the ministers to come in and do the prayer, and they it pretty much lost interest. After a while, it resorted to council. Um, it, it, it wasn't working very well. Uh, and then it was put on to council members at one time that they were in charge. They, could be, they would be mayor pro tem for that month and also they were supposed to make sure that someone was here to do the prayer or they would do it themselves. Uh, when Mayor O'Brien was having such difficulty getting people to do it and the council at that time didn't appear to be interested, uh, we dropped it. And then through Mayor Hopkins' term, four years, we didn't have the prayer. And I personally would uh, just as soon keep it the way it is now I don't see any, unless there's some super rationale for bringing it back, uh, I don't see it's necessary. I did um, <clears throat> talk to Greg about this this <clears throat> week and asked him the, the history of why it was removed and he said similar to what you said. And so I agreed to take full responsibility to arrange um, for the invocation speaker each week of the council meeting. I will take um, responsibility for that, ensuring that I ask people from all varieties of faiths in our community and not just one, and um, that that will not be put back onto any of the council members. Your Honor, what's the rationale for, for this? I think it's something that important. I read a lot of the history of the council meetings. I think um, in the history of Muscatine, it has always been felt by council to be an important piece um, in our city and local government and um, the fact that it wasn't done this past four years shouldn't preclude us from thinking that it, it is any less important to the history of our community. I don't think that the, <clears throat> the history of the city started back in 1850 and the, and the prayer started with Mayor Schollen which was probably in the 1970s. Uh, I don't see it being a long-standing history. It was it was done as a matter of that it was here and, and people, we, it was just done as a routine and it was pretty easy to get out of that routine. And I, I don't see any reason to bring it back. Um, we have, if, if you're going to truly bring in, if it's an invocation, is that a, are you talking a prayer or exactly what, what type of <clears throat> invocation means a couple different things to me. An invocation can mean a poem, can mean a prayer, can mean a variety of things. I think it needs to be kept very short. Um, I don't think anybody's interested in extending the time of any of the council meetings. Um, but if, <clears throat> if uh, one of them chose to read a small poem or something like that, I think that would be okay. But traditionally, it has been a very short prayer. Um, I understand what you're saying, that um, you don't see any reason to add it back in, um, perhaps there's not a reason not to either. And I, from my reading back in history, I think it was done in the early 60s as well. But I, I, don't, I don't remember, I don't know when Evelyn Shawlin was mayor, so that, I just know she was referred to as the mayor for the longest time. Mm, yes, <laughs> still is. Personally, I yes. don't have a problem with reintroducing it, especially if you've got if you're I'm taking, certainly willing taking it over and, and I did a little bit of research on on this subject in general across the country and the even the Supreme Court has heard cases and they you know it's usually five to four one way or the other so there's without going through all the arguments like. there's good arguments either way your honor I'd like to ask Greg Greg is there kind of follow-up to what uh, Scott was saying is there legal considerations of what we have to take in the what can be said, what can't be said, et cetera? We could, we could certainly develop a policy so that um, uh, those that were presenting at, at the council meeting knew what the parameters were, and we could certainly work uh, to do that. Um, I'd asked uh, Fran to just do a real quick search on some other communities, and uh, Bettendorf does do invocation. Um, our peer communities do not do uh, invocation. But uh, I would expect us to to, uh, you could easily come up with a, a set of criteria uh, that you can hand out to whomever is conducting the invocation. Um, I, uh, I believe there was a 20, 
2014 Supreme Court case that allowed uh, the uh, city councils to choose to have or, or not have prayer or invocation at the start of a meeting. Okay. Well, I'm not opposed to having that either, although I'd hate to open up a Pandora's box, you know, by doing that. So that's why I was... What, what are we invoking for? What are we praying for? The prayer can be in general for the particular council meeting of the evening. It could be for our community as a whole. It could be for our country, for any specific thing or event going on at the time. I would leave that up to the person saying the prayer. Mayor, I would, would certainly uh, uh, agree with you that uh, and, and support you. You've, you've <coughs> in my book, have, have covered all of the objections. You have answers. You're you're you're, you're taking the uh, uh, the possibility of of any objections back onto yourself, and I certainly applaud you for that. Thank you, Bob. Tonight is the decision tonight, or is it to be brought up later? I I, I need a, like a consensus of council to bring it back or not. It does take a six six member vote to adopt an amendment to the council rules. Um, and if there's not a consensus to bring it forward, if there's not support to bring it forward, you know, why go through the process? When, if and when you brought it back, would you have proposed policy that you described uh, we, developed? We could, we could certainly do that. Mm -hmm. Not sure it would be, ne be, be next week, though. <laughs> it might be an important part of the decision is, you know, what are, what are the ground rules, if you will. So I'm not opposed to having you bring something back for us to look at. So what do you need from us now? I, I'd, I'd probably go around the table and simply see if there's a consensus of six council members. If there is, we'll bring it back at a later date for council consideration. Bob? Follow the process. Aye. Alan? Yes. Tom? Alan? It's not a vote. Yeah. It's just yes. consensus. Aye. <clears throat> Tom? No. Santos? Aye. Yes. Scott. <coughs> Bill. I don't think it's necessary. Mike. Okay. <coughs> the uh, fourth item on our agenda is the CIP present presentation. <coughs> Andrew. I, I'm, I'm going to keep this pretty short. Um, at the at the at, at our last in depth meeting, I, I distributed first draft of uh, the fiscal year 2016 <coughs> through 2020 capital improvement plan you know, and at that time I said I'd be back at a future meeting to gather any input that you may have on the plan so that's what I'm here for tonight to uh, gather any changes you might like to see or see if there's a consensus to move forward with the adoption of the plan so I guess at that point I'd entertain any questions you have either on the capital improvement plan the process or any of the particulars or anything you'd like to see changed in it Andrew, can you mention uh, the water pollution control plant? Oh, yeah, I apologize. I did, me did mean to mention that. It, it, between tonight and the last meeting when I presented it to you, I had an update of projects come to me from the water pollution control plant. So with your agenda packets, you were provided with an updated plan reflecting more current list of their projects. Okay. Andrew, I don't know if this is your bailiwick or not, but do we have any... Uh, Capital, yeah, do we have any property or anything that we could dispense with to add funds to your program? Um, I, I can think of that there probably is some surplus property, but um, it, very small. I mean, I, I don't think we have anything that probably wind up selling for more than $10,000. So it, it's, it's a mostly small lots where we've probably demolished a house on that aren't quite big enough to build another house on that we'd probably sell to an adjoining property owner. Unless unless we modify unless our we planning and zoning. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but we are taking a look at it. Uh, Andrew's prepared some preliminary information and, and, uh, and the, uh, we'll the benefit to that would be you know additional infill housing. I, I don't see it as something where we'd get a lot of money um, and the money we got would be mostly probably covering expenses that we put out for demolition and the only only one of large track of land that 
we've talked about in the past is Iowa Field, and I don't think we want to go there again. Been there, done that. <laughs> but there are several that we should look at, especially with the amended zoning ordinance that would provide an opportunities. And there's several ways that you could dispose of the property, and we could specifically ask for infill development on those yeah. properties uh, as a condition of of, of selling the lots. So, you know. Uh, maybe we don't want to see strictly green space for an adjacent property, or maybe we want to actually see a home built on, right, yeah. on, on that property. So we could certainly put those conditions <coughs> on it and sell it at a, at a discount in order to get a home put on those lots. So, I mean, there's, there's plenty of ways that we could dispose of the property and certainly encourage us to take a look at, 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 at infill in, 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 the, in that downtown area. Double the price and give them a 50% discount if they build a house. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you, you, besides discounting the property, we could do a on specific sites we've done a, a tax abatement for absolutely and several of them. and so forth if we did a tax abatement for five years 100 percent of the of the cost of the house in five years or six years then the full property comes up and it's and it's a hundred thousand dollar or more home several of them are now on um, the tax rolls several of them are already in a tax abatement area and then I we would, could uh, we could easily create an additional tax abatement area if we i would to. estimate somewhere between 75 percent 80 percent probably already in the tax abatement area that we sent up in 2013. so there's that 30 percent we're missing absolutely <laughs> we could certainly and we can certainly amend amend the tax abatement uh, section to to add areas as well because we have a particular property up on West Third that uh, may not be a buildable lot under today's standards. So that may be really, that one, really close. No, that one actually, the one, that one is buildable in our current standards and is within the abatement district and within the, okay. the additional, there's, there's even an additional abatement that they can take advantage of because it's in the historic district okay. if they meet certain standards. Okay. Andrew and Greg, would you, you know, God only knows what the city owns that I don't know about. And look at an inventory of stuff we own, structures or lots or whatever, and see if there's something that might possibly uh, we could rule on whether we want to keep it or unload it. We, we, I have in the past prepared maps of city-owned parcels. I, I can certainly share that. that. That's a question that gets asked. That is something we, we do monitor. Thank you. I haven't looked at your email yet, Andrew. Did, is, is that a map that's included in there or just a summary? I can map that. It, it, okay. it's, it's a table. Um, okay. Absolutely. You have the um, map that I requested? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I want to. I'd like to have that printed, and so I could, or at least sent to me, so I can see it. We'll bring that back for a, for a council. Wasn't that on a February in depth or something? So there Which, was something coming up on that, wasn't there? What did you related request? to that? The in basically, it was an in location of infill properties within the city that may not be buildable lots according to today's standards. Oh, this, the 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 little the. Um, what do you you got a term for them, Andrew? For the 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 small non-fill lots. lots. No, yeah, not, thought, the, thought, not infill, but uh, the you know the those those parcels that we have that uh, I, I, maybe the adjacent owner would pick up or or those tiny little you've got a name for them. I can't think of what it is. Well, they but. weren't. They're not necessarily. No, no, no. This is, I think, when you for the the, the vacant <coughs> lots in the city, not necessarily the ones that we own that are that are right. vacant but buildable. Right. Gotcha. Yeah, we had something on that. Uh, question, Andrew. So the numbers you sent us didn't include lots that you could, if you jiggled the code around, could be buildable? What numbers? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have them with me, so I can't be specific. I thought you had some The one that went on the council update, uh, the one that I, I sent Hold down. that thought. I'll ask you when I know more of whatever. Okay. And what is, the procedure, <laughs> what is the procedure for abandoned property? Uh, or uh, that purple house on West Third has been abandoned for over four years. I mean, do we have to go to the county tax sale to get to get well, title I mean, to it? There is a procedure, by and a lot of the lots that we're talking about, there's lots that we can send to the process by which we can take them for back taxes. Um, if they're abandoned, if they're being maintained to city code and the taxes are being paid, there, there's not very much that we can do. So. On that map, we'll include two different items. One are city-owned property, but then also different color for those that uh, are available for tax sale Yeah. as well. And that list I sent you breaks right. it down like that. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, I'll include the list in the update tomorrow then. I haven't yeah. opened the, my email yet. Well, no, the, 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 <laughs> the information I was looking for, and I, and I requested Magic the, uh, mark, the Marks, and he said he sent it to him. Okay. 
was I, buildable lots within the city of Muskegon. I thought I sent that out, but maybe I... Yeah. I don't remember getting it. I'll, I'll, I'll resend I think it. We, so. we, we talked about it, but I don't, I don't remember oh. getting I, it. I've made the map, so I'll make sure you get it tomorrow. Okay. Sounds good. Andrew, the, the one on West 3rd is across from Riverview Gallery. Mm -hmm. It's a god-awful purple house. Yep, I'm familiar with it. Uh, <laughs> it has all sorts of red stickers all over the door. Is that... I mean, it's condemned or not? The, the orange right? stickers typically means that we're plowing and mowing the, or shoveling the walks and mowing the grass, and then so okay. they owe the city money. Thank you. <laughs> that was his, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Well, I, I get, you know, circling back to the, the CIP, I was kind of hoping is there a consensus to. <clears throat> You know, prepare it for adoption by resolution. There is, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Or if there's anything, additions or changes anyone would like. And this is a five-year, for a five-year plan, but. This is a five-year plan. Next year, we could alter that plan. Well, you're supposed to do it every year, too, so yeah. it, it's kind of a rolling five-year. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. And, and it's a guiding document? Not a. It's not a binding document. Yeah. Right. Now bring it forth. It, like it really you say just on there, we can't you know. afford it all, so it kind of. <laughs> well, that, that's why the, one of the things that we <laughs> added for the first time when we did this Two years ago was kind of we uh, prioritization score where we developed I think eight questions and scored each project based on that based on a variety of criteria to kind of help with the prioritization of different right. projects. <clears throat> okay. 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 Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a leadership Muscatine presentation. Adam. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, as you can see, the well, right side for you guys of council chambers is pretty well full up. Uh, no one decided to sit on the left. Um, I told the class to sit on on the right, and oh yeah, we got you're the odd you're the odd man out tonight. All those are on the left. <laughs> it obviously is. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the leadership Muscatine class. I th I'm pretty. Sure, I would hope many of you are aware of leadership Muscatine. Many of you, I'm, I'm assuming, have been through leadership Muscatine at some point. But uh, Leadership Muscatine is generally uh, a group of uh, relatively new people to Muscatine or have been in Muscatine and are in a position in the community that they want to learn more about Muscatine. Leadership Muscatine's class tonight was on local government. Uh, we spent uh, the early afternoon at the Muscatine uh, power plant. Um, learning about MPNW's operations. Uh, we had a discussion with Greg, uh, council member spread, and Cass Kelly from the county um, talking about local government operations. Um, and one of the biggest things that I, not biggest things, but one of the things I want the class to get out of this is to know that you as their uh, council representatives are open to talk to that you guys don't bite um, and that you know you want to do what is in the best interest for the community and, and for them as well. Um, so in one of the ways to try to break that barrier uh, so they're not scared <laughs> of you guys is they're actually going to come up here. They're going to introduce themselves to you. Um, and one of the elements of Leadership Muscatine is you have to complete a class project. Um, a project that has some good for the community of Muscatine or the Muscatine area. So the groups are going to come up here and they're actually going to do a very, very short um, discussion on what their project is, literally a minute or two. Um, they're not going to be 15 minutes each. Um, do you guys have any questions on Leadership Muscatine or, or what they're trying to do um, before, before we bring them up? Who's the head of it now? If, one, if we have an idea for a project, who would we contact? Um, the Chamber of Commerce is, is where Leadership Muscatine okay. is housed. Uh, Janet, Janet is really, I think, kind of the point person for Leadership Muscatine right now. Okay. Um, and she'd be the one. And, and early, I think, October, November, uh, November sometime is when they look at past projects and they start developing their projects for the next year. So around November of next year, if you know, there's a project or, or something that uh, you may have an idea for, um, please convey those to Janet and we'll get on the, the list of to-dos. There's a long, <laughs> a long list of possible projects in Muscatine. All right. Uh, with that, uh, you guys just kind of pick who, what group wants to come up and... The leadership here. The whole group. I want yep. all of you. Yep. Why don't you hang I'll talk for you, okay? Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> 
introduce yourselves, <laughs> where you work, and then someone talk about the project. Come on, Kelsey. Go ahead, Herman. All right, first. well, thank you. Well, let me just introduce, uh, introduce myself. I, uh, my name's Herman So. I uh, came to Muscatine six, seven months ago. So I'm, I think there's one guy beat me here, but I'm probably second <laughs> newest member to the city. Uh, I work for GPC um, in new product development. And uh, so this is my team on, and I think John will talk about this project, but I'll be here support. Each of you introduce yourself, <laughs> go ahead. Welcome. My name is Amir Vizovic, and I'm an electrical engineer at Muscatine Power and Water. Uh, moved to Muscatine about a year and a half ago, originally from uh, Berlin, Germany. <clears throat> Big move. <laughs> Lance Longstreth, I was born and raised in Muscatine. I also work for Muscatine Power and Water. I currently reside in Fruitland. And my name is John Weigel, and I work at Green Processing Corporation in alcohol loading. I load happiness to the world. <laughs> um, our project, and, it, and the vast amount of projects that were tossed at us that we could choose, pick, comb through. Melanie Alexander from the Muscatine Art Center did a fabulous job leading us down the path of rehabbing the Japanese gardens. So we are going to take on the project of rebuilding the pergola, the Torrey Gate, uh, some of the bridges and the buildings, mainly all the woodworking stuff because we've got a lot of woodworking talent in our group. So that's our goal. We get to work with Greg and Melanie and a few others and Pull that out. So if anybody wants to donate a little bit, we could take donations too. <laughs> so that's our project. Great. Thank you. That's a good one. Next group. Lupe. <clears throat> Three, four. Good evening. Tony Kelly. I'm with Monsanto. I've lived here for just about a year now. Oops. I'm Matt Wett. I work uh, downstairs in the finance department. I've met some of you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Junk and I grew up actually in Illinois City. I worked for Monsanto, and about two years ago, I had the chance to essentially move back home. And actually, if it's permissible with the council, could we pass out some Please. information on our event? And I am uh, Mike Moyer. I'm from uh, Wilton. I work at Carver Pump Company as a mechanical engineer. I've been here all my life. And I'm Kelsey Hodap. I work at First National Bank, and I'm from Muscatine. So as the information is making its way around uh, the council, um, our, idea was to, our idea is to bring back the Soapbox Derby to Muscatine. Um, from 1937 to 1966, Muscatine had a Soapbox Derby, with, with the exception of, of the time period during World War II. Um, and really our goal as a committee was to, to hold a fun, unique event that will appeal to young adults or just adults that are young at heart. And we want this to attract people to the downtown area and also raise money for a, a local cause. Um, and, and really into this endeavor, we're following some other communities. Uh, Portland, Oregon is probably the largest and most well-known, but also smaller communities like Nevada City, California, and, and holding an adult soapbox derby. Uh, you can see some of the pictures that are actually included in there to kind of highlight what the event uh, would entail. Um, we're still we're full steam ahead, but we have some more conversations with city and, and other folks on on how we will do this and uh, making sure that we do it with the uh, with the approval of the city. So we're we're really excited. It's been a lot of fun, and we we look forward to your support. You're going to use Green Street. <laughs> no. <laughs> Demolition. <laughs> Soapbox derby. No, we we <laughs> certainly want it to be a fun event, but we want it to be a safe event. Safe. <laughs> Good idea. Miller Hill. Good idea. Good idea. It's a great project. I like it. So please like us and share us on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a good project to, to, to learn how to interact with the city on different things. You know. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's <laughs> cool. Hi, my name is Carmen Bouguet. I'm from Grain Processing Corporation. I'm originally from Romania. <laughs> so I've been in Muscatine for two years and uh, have lived mostly in the Midwest, especially the Indianapolis, Indiana area. My project is with the Muscatine Symphony Orchestra. I have some orchestra. I play the violin. I have orchestra background. I've been on boards before. 
So my project is to help them raise funds to sponsor the principal chairs. Right now they have five principal chair sponsors out of 12. So my project is to help with the other seven that are not sponsors and raise funds. So any of you that play a specific instrument, we have available strings, woodwinds, brass, um, and keyboards as well, which includes harp and piano. So if you're interested, for $2,000, uh, I'm taking any sponsors, either individual sponsors or company sponsors. Come see me. Tell me, please. I know what it means to sponsor a chair in a major orchestra, yes, but I'm sir. not sure what it means in, in our case. Um, this is on the principal chairs. For example, like the concertmaster is sponsored already by either individual or corporation. Um, so each principal chair, the leader of that specific sen um, section is going to be sponsored. So that way they get a little bit, um, right now they're not paid, they're voluntary. But it would give them a little bit of funds as far as, you know, just gas money. Um, so this so. goes to the first, to the individual in the, okay. Yes. Carmen, Great. aren't some, aren't some of them paid right now, a few of them? Uh, some oh, are. That's right. uh, the, well, the concertmeister is. Yeah. Okay. That's it. The rest are all voluntary. Okay. Oh, just the one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. She said five are sponsored already. My name's Linda Sabrin. I started working at Muscatine Veterinary Hospital in August. I currently reside in Riverside. Um, I joined Leadership Muscatine to learn a little bit about the town that I uh, spend most of my time in now. Uh, my project, uh, the original project I wanted to do fell through, and so I'm going to do a childhood dream of mine, which is to join uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Good organization. I'm Naomi D. Winter, and I have the privilege of serving after Buzz Alby as the president of Muscatine <laughs> Community College. I've been here for about five months, and it's been a marvelous time to be here. I want to thank you first for your service to our community. My project involves uh, leading the faculty, staff, and students at MCC to work more closely with the students at Colorado Elementary School. We're such close neighbors that we'd like to in, involve them in many of our activities by inviting them for events such as college days. Our biology students will lead field trips at Weed Park. We'll have joint meetings between their student government and our student senate. We'll have speakers that are faculty, staff, or students, and we'll, and we'll also volunteer at the school. So our hope is that those 267 kids <coughs> will leave that school thinking and believing that they will be in college and, and at some point in their lives, and we hope that that will also be in, that, in their community college. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, this is not intimidating at all. <laughs> my name is Danny Zumwalt. I'm the executive director at Flickinger Learning Center. Um, my project is called uh, Animated Academics. So what I'm going to do is bring in more physical activity into the classroom. It's been proven that kids that are more active in the classroom setting, they retain more. They are more relaxed. They have a better time, and learning is more fun. Um, currently, uh, McKinley School has recently got an influx of children of various degrees of behavioral disorders. So I've spoken to Joelle there, and we're going to start there. Um, our first step would be to get these, um, they go underneath the desk, and they're, uh, they can pedal. They're completely quiet. They can still do it and retain instruction. Um, we're going to take data. She's already starting it now, and we're going to do it through the process and check afterwards. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to expand it to every school in the district. Hmm. How, many, we'll how many students are you doing that with? Um, we are going to outfit enough to fit two classrooms. Um, they're portable, so they can move around the whole entire school. So essentially, they're going to benefit um, all 327 kids at that school. How much does a unit cost? Um, each set is $27.50. This is appropriate physical activity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to see a lot of the inappropriate physical activity. <laughs> does, uh, will you use these at the Flickinger Center also? 
Um, well, and that's kind of where it came from. At Flickinger, our kids have a lot of autonomy. So my kids get to walk around and they have more physical room and our kids are doing great as a result of that. So I thought, why not expand that into our school system that desperately needs it? So. Great, good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just one more. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lupe Vasquez, and I cannot take credit for my project because I'm helping Kai Cochran. Um, we're going to do uh, the second street of the month event, and it will be from May to October. It's more of a festival, and our plan is to close down Second Street from Cedar to Pine Street and to bring in live music, um, vendors, um, and other things to attract more um, people from Muscatine. We have sent out a survey to the um, business owners of downtown, and we just need to put all that together and see what their point of it is, too. So, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> uh, as you can see, you know, Leadership Muscatine's been going on for over 30 plus years, and is, is a great organization, has done a lot of great things in the Muscatine community, and is continuing to do them. You know, these are great projects that really benefit uh, the community of Muscatine uh, well into the future. Um, I won't take any more of your time. Class, you guys can leave after this. I appreciate you guys staying as long as you have. Um, but if you guys want to leave, you can. If you'd like to stay, you can do that as well. So thank you, Council. Thank you, thank Adam. You. We appreciate well done. it. Next on the agenda is we will review the NEPA study requirements. Jim. Thank you, Mayor. Council. There's two pieces of paper that were at your place when you sat down. It is a wonderfully simple um, project development flow chart. And if I get this right, it goes something like this. This time we have a federal or state funded project. This is the process you work your way through. Now, sometimes it's not near as complicated as this, but at the top of the second page, right at the very top of the second page, you'll see that it says FHWA environmental concurrence is received. Translation, you have met all the requirements of NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act. And there's a whole lot of work that needs to be go, it needs to happen and occur to just get that one little square, rectangle, whatever you want to call it, to be able to go through that rectangle. We have uh, Mike Fisher and Ryan Peterson here from Impact 7G. They are doing the NEPA environmental work for the Grandview Avenue corridor, which is to follow the Mississippi River Drive corridor work and is in this uh, STP process. And uh, they're here to just give you a brief overview of what that kind of consists of. Because I know for me, um, you don't deal with it every day. You kind of tend to lose track of, of all the things that that is, is involved, all the things that are involved in that. So with that, uh, I don't know which one of you guys is going to go first. but. Thanks, yeah. Thank you all for having us here today. Again, I'm Mike Fisher from Impact 7G. And I'm going to try to make this brief. This is the National Environmental Policy Act. This is our nation's charter regarding environmental policy. That was, I think there's a keyboard here. So there's uh, some information on the screen too. I will pass out some of this information when, when we are finished as well, so you'll have it. Because um, I know you want to keep this for your records and to go back and, and learn a little bit more about NEPA. Um, NEPA is about 45 years old, believe it or not. Um, and I've been practicing NEPA for 25 years of my career. I actually had a degree that emphasized environmental impact assessment from the University of Kansas. So it was an environmental science degree that emphasized how do you implement NEPA at all levels. Um, it is, um, as Jim said, um, applicable to federal agencies that make federal decisions or that spend um, federal funding, essentially. And it's designed to uh, allow agency disclosure of what are they proposing to do with that money or with that decision. 
Um, it, it created the basis for what we call environmental impact statement or EIS. And the EIS is the granddaddy of NEPA in terms of the amount of effort, um, time, and energy that is spent trying to um, provide that full disclosure for what are often contentious proposed actions by the federal government. Um, NEPA also created the Council on Environmental Quality, which is essentially kind of as the oversight body for the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, and believe it or not, it was signed by President Nixon on January 1st in 1970, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on that day, so it was something for him to get in the press. But uh, again, uh, passed in the, in the late 60s, signed by President Nixon on January 1st, 1970. Um, when does NEPA apply? Um, as Jim says, generally when there's federal funding um, or an effort to, to approve a proposed federal action. Um, some actions are excluded from NEPA, so you could have a federal action, and most of the federal agencies, whether it's the Federal Aviation Administration, Federal Highway Administration, um, FERC, uh, they all have their list of actions that they say, well, these are actions that we don't think apply to NEPA. They may be an administrative actions or so forth. So there's some that are excluded. Um, in the case of Grandview Avenue, I have a picture of kind of the corridor up there. Um, we have some surface transportation program funding that is, that is scheduled for fiscal year 2019, um, and based on what, what I understand, it's $1.5 million of funding related to that, that overall project on Grandview Avenue. Um, so we have, a federal, we have federal funding. We have Federal Highway Administration funding, $1.5 million on Grandview Avenue. NEPA applies. So what's next? Well, Generally what happens is we, we look to the DOT who's been handled authority to classify this action of spending this funding on Grandview Avenue for the proposed improvements. And they classify it as a categorical exclusion or an environmental impact statement. And if, they, if we don't know whether or not there's potentially significant environmental or socioeconomic impacts associated with the action, that is, is it gonna cause negative socioeconomic impacts or significant positive socioeconomic impacts. If we don't know that, the DOT says, well, we want you to do an environmental assessment. It's kind of the middle of the road approach to NEPA. And it's, a, it's essentially a process that is documented in what we call an EA, an environmental assessment, and concludes with a FONSI, or a finding of no significant impact. The FONSI is what we call the decision document that gets to the box that Jim was talking about, the concurrence box signed by Federal Highway Administration that says, yes, you've, you've met your requirement for NEPA, you can go proceed with design of the project. Now that the decision's made as to how you are proposing that action. <clears throat> this is a simplified flow chart from what Jim gave you, and <clears throat> I've highlighted kind of the area that we're in, or that we expect to be in with DOT. Uh, we are proposing a concept statement on Granby Avenue in terms of the project, and um, I highly suspect that this is the path that we'll take based on uh, my extensive experience with road projects in Iowa and working with the Iowa DOT Office of Location and Environment. So uh, essentially an uh, EA process there. <clears throat> and I do not expect at this point that we will run into significant, that word is key in NEPA, significant environmental impacts, um, or the other thing that triggers an EIS is that May, makes impact seem significant is a high level of controversy. So if you have a very highly controversial action, for instance, in southern Iowa, there's a regional airport being proposed. And it is highly controversial because of some of the land that's needed in and around that airport, noise concerns, etc. So this action I do not suspect, based on my experience, um, uh, we'll, we'll move to what we would call an environmental impact statement, which would take a minimum of five years to complete, which would take us beyond our federal funding, period. So we are proceeding with, and I think I jumped ahead here. So this is, <clears throat> this is a preliminary a Gantt chart of what it takes to do an EA. I'm not gonna go into all these tasks, but what I would like to point out up here is that I propose this particular project based on what I have found out uh, from the city, uh, working with Jim, scanning and, and doing preliminary reconnaissance on the corridor, doing some preliminary research on uh, cultural issues, 
even prehistoric type uh, sediments that might be in the area, that type of thing that can raise concerns with the SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, um, that this is the schedule that we propose we can get this project done in. This is what we are working on with a procedural process. And what you'll see up there highlighted in that yellow is essentially um, a 21 to 24 month process. NEPA, do, NEPA does not occur overnight. Um, we will begin field studies in the spring. That will include wetlands, um, contaminated sites, um, where we might be acquiring what right away, looking for contaminated site issues. It will include the uh, cultural resource investigations, which include standing structures as well as archaeological work. So NEPA looks at a whole host of uh, potential environmental um, uh, resources that might be affected by the proposed action. Um, some of the key process decisions as part of this process, which is essentially, and this is very important, NEPA is designed to prevent uninformed decisions. So what we had in the 1960s prior to NEPA was major federal highway projects, right? Let's take the interstate system. The decision was, we're going to run it straight through the center of Iowa. And this is our path. Not acknowledging the fact that you might have eliminated um, some very important species to certain environmental groups out there. Or not acknowledging the fact that you might have taken some great farmland out of production. Um, so we look at even farmland issues on, on some projects. So this is um, the, the, to prevent uninformed decisions and so that this action, we, we know what we're getting into when we propose the design for this project, when we're looking at the right-of-way needs for this project. We know ahead of time what the potential environmental and socioeconomic impacts are. That's what the NEPA is designed to do. Unfortunately, uh, because of the process and procedure part of it, it, it does take a while to get through the, I'll use the word bureaucracy of NEPA, um, the process essentially. essentially. Um, NEPA asks you to look at a range of alternatives. Are there alternatives to this project in terms of design that we need to address that minimizes any impact to cultural resources or that minimizes impacts to, um, uh, say, uh, wet wetlands that might be in the corridor? I don't think we have any in this corridor that are significant, but in, in many projects you, you run into wet wetland issues which you have to deal with the Corps of Engineers and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on. So we look at our alternatives. Um, you know, other process decisions are determining what our preferred alternative or our, our likely our, end up being our selected alternative is. Um, and in some cases, we propose mitigation. Um, 